Well, hello everybody and welcome to, uh, to this year's uh, Open Sin Community Convention. Uh, the year that time forgot, <laughs> 2020. Oh, well, it hasn't yet. Um, okay, um, this um, this is, well, it's a sort of panel, but it's more of a sort of a general conversation about the future. Um, my name, as you probably know, is Mal Burns. So I host uh, Meta World News and um, the In World Review, which we, we film from here. Um, but this year has been a rather strange one, um, as everybody I think knows. Um, firstly, we've had, the, well, possibly as a result, we've had the COVID virus going around, um, around the whole world, that is, uh, which has had a, a distinct effect on the uh, number of people and um, spending time online and the amount of time they spend online. Um, so one of the things I think of interest at the moment is to get an idea of the future in terms of um, what has happened as a result of the pandemic. The other thing that I think is a major issue at the moment, and I know my guest and many other people um, are aware of this, is it's almost as if the um, we've suddenly seen the rise of a whole load of newcomers on the scene, probably as a result of the pandemic. Some good, some bad, but almost newbies <laughs> in many ways. Obviously, there are established platforms like this around. But what is curious is, for example, that a year ago, the, the name Skype was almost ubiquitous. It, it's now Zoom. What happened? What, you know, it's like the whole world suddenly forgot Skype and moved to Zoom, um, which, of course, is online socialization, although uh, hardly virtual, so to speak. Anyway, to discuss all this and more, um, I'm joined um, basically by Kent Bai, who's the host of um, a program called uh, Voices of VR. Welcome, Kent. Thanks, Mal. Thanks for having me here. It feels uh, great to be able to get into OpenSim. Um, yeah, I've been I've been sort of covering the voice uh, the virtual reality field since like May of 2014, and uh, kind of consider myself like an oral historian trying to track the evolution of the medium. Um, you know, obviously virtual worlds have been around for a lot longer than, you know, 2012 to 2014 when VR started to come up in the scene. So um, it's interesting to be here uh, just to see the all the different levels of, um, you know, the, the user interface that I'd say is more web-based than so VR-based. If, if the same interface was in VR, it'd be, you know, hard to read the text and it'd be uh, very overwhelming to someone who's sort of embodied so yeah, this this combination of embodiment and uh, these different degrees of presence. Um, uh, this year in particular, I've been paying a lot of attention to the future of virtual gatherings and uh, virtual conferences, uh, especially with the dimension of virtuality and what does virtuality really add to that. Um, and I see that there's a, a bit of a fusion of taking a little bit of the teleconferencing, a little bit of the Zoom. Uh, there's certain dynamics that you have in this type of virtual environment uh, that is a little bit more text-based or uh, you know 2D on the on the web. Um, so yeah, just trying to figure out the affordances of each of those and how they all fit together because I think that's if there's any one trend, uh, it's a kind of the mashing together of all these different affordances and how do we kind of reach this. Uh, perfect combination of everything, and I think we're we're still pretty far away away from sort of finding that that good sweet spot of trying to draw on the affordances of everything. But I think this year has really been a catalyst for people to really start to experiment a lot more with these ways of virtually gathering. Yes, I I, I would tend to agree. I mean, um, there's been quite a lot of innovation, despite that there's a lot of copycat going along. I mean, I I know, for example, you you um, you held a little session in um, Philip Rosedale's new audio high fidelity, um, uh, where he and uh, I and a whole load of people were, for example, and that was an example of somewhere where it wasn't Zoom, and it wasn't really a virtual world. It was just this flat space. Uh, we, you know, we had our photo icons, as it were, and uh, as we moved from different points on the map, you know, the voices of people around us faded out and then faded back in again. So it's a, a kind of audio virtuality, for want of another word, um, which was quite fascinating because um, also in some of the other new um, worlds, well, they've been at it a while, the offshoots from high fidelity. Um, 
we are very much now becoming concerned with voice. I mean, um, and you often can't even text in these worlds. They assume you'll have a microphone and they assume you're going to be talking. And, you know, I'll be sitting there thinking, oh, somebody can't hear me. I better type a note. And hey, where do I type it? You know, so it seems to me that one of the major obstacles we're coming uh, across, um, particularly from the social world's point, but from everything, is that all these new programs all seem to require a new learning curve. You know, the keystrokes that work in one don't work in another. The physics engines that run them are different. I mean, a lot of it's in Unity, but then again, you've got Samsung and other platforms that have their own unique engines. And also, of course, they don't, this has been a big bear for a long while, they don't interoperate. Now, do you do? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're concerned with the grace of VR thing, and um, there are fortunately a lot of platforms around, say, Science Space, for example, where you can view them on a 2D screen as a traditional monitor, and it's still a fully 3D world, or you can go in in a headset. Um, but there are, you know, there are great differences, aren't there? As you know, if you go in in a headset, you you don't normally see yourself, for one thing, and um, you don't normally know if you're legless, to put it politely. <laughs> um, you know, so you can be in the same place, but the way the presence feels is very different. Now, have you had, in, I mean, I, I should tell the audience here, by the way, that Kent here, I mean, he interviewed, he posts on Voices of VR about three or four interviews a week. I mean, where you get that energy, I don't know. But in your experience, <laughs> um, have these issues come up at all? Well, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that come up as you sort of uh, recounting a lot of these different things. Um, there's a number of different qualities of presence that I tend to try to break things down into. And uh, we can start with, say, like uh, this space here where it's uh, where there's a lot of text, there's a lot of uh, user interface options. You know, it's sort of like taking the affordances of like a web app and the kind of affordances of kind of pull down menus and stuff. And it feels like I'm in a application that would be like Photoshop or something where there's like, it's like the Swiss army knife of virtual worlds. Uh, but you know, for anybody who is using any piece of software, there's, you have to learn what all the menu items are and what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so, uh, something that just launched uh, a couple of days ago was, uh, uh, Greg Fodor's gel app, which is sort of a pared down version of, um, you know, the Mozilla hubs. So that's an example where he's just trying to uh, just strip out all of the user interface and just say, okay, if you want to just do collaboration in a 2D world and you're moving around and you're able to talk with other people, but essentially exchange like text and different formats, then let's just make it as simple as possible, have very like uh, clear key strokes that you can do and then sort of really focus on that. And um, so I've, I've, I come from the world of content management systems. And so you can look at something like Drupal versus WordPress. Drupal is like the Swiss army knife that has like uh, this optimized for the highest level of flexibility. But whenever you dial down in any specific context, it's always going to be like imperfect for that context. And there's always going to be like some kludgy ways in which that you kind of have to like force the system to kind of just make it work. Um, or there's is still going to have like this overwhelm of user interface, something like WordPress, you can start to get a lot more simpler, but there's always that trade off between the flexibility that you want versus like the elegance of the user experience, uh, in order to really, you know, fit into a very specific context. So that's one issue. There's the whole other issue here, which is the dimensions of presence. Um, and I think it's worth maybe just kind of speaking about maybe some of the, uh, big, uh, experiences that are out there both in virtual world so like Fortnite um or you know um you know rec room uh, but these virtual spaces and so i'm just going to run through these four qualities of presence you have active presence mental and social presence emotional presence and embodied presence and so right now in this space i'd say this more mental and social presence because there's so much word so much text you have to do a lot of reading there's a text chat that's going on at the same time um so there's a lot of great accessibility options there uh, and there is a voice chat that people are, you know, uh, having, a, hearing our voice here. Um, and so, but there's also all these other dimensions of, um, you know, so just typical of uh, the internet, the World Wide Web, your, your cell phone, you know, so all these ways that you sort of use the abstractions of language to be able to connect to other people. Um, and there's a lot of different dimensions of user interface and user interaction design that's being ported into virtual reality. 
Um, so let's look at, say, like the active presence. So that's like the ways that you can express your will and agency into any given experience. So in this world, you can kind of navigate around uh, and you can sort of um, sit down, but you don't have like, well, it, there's, um, you're not like playing a game, you know, it's not like rec room where you have this full embodiment and it's a lot about like playing games with each other. And that's like really taking off with the youth. Um, I'd say like, you know, folks that were maybe graduating from uh, Minecraft or Warblocks and they want to have like an immersive VR experience, but they still want to kind of play with their friends. Uh, then rec room is like a great room, great place to be able to kind of play around in that way. And it's really optimized for high agency, high interactivity. Uh, so you're able to kind of engage with everything that's in that world. But then you move into something that I'd, I'd say more, also in that, in that sort of, uh, I guess, high agency would be something like Fortnite, which is, you know, it's a game, you know, but it's also starting to become like this platform to be able to have like music concerts as well. So it's sort of like uh, the game world that's there. People are kind of there to, to uh, do the, the building and the, the, the playing of that game. But they also have these other dimensions of being able to connect to their friends socially. Um, so then you go to something like maybe emotional presence. I'd say something like the wave or the wave XR where you're able to go in and just listen to music and really vibe out. Um, or this is just also just like immersive stories. Uh, it's more passive. Uh, 360 video would be uh, uh, really modulating your sense of emotional presence. But any ways that you are able to build and release tension to really get you emotionally engaged into the experience. Um, and so the wave XR and just in general, the process of gathering for virtual conference, uh, like concerts, um, is, is a, a good example of like emotional presence. Now the embodied presence, that's where I think VR is really starting to shine in terms of, um, you feel like your, your body is there. You feel like a sense of environmental presence, but you also are hacking your, your sensory experiences of your sight, your, your, uh, hearing with spatialized audio, but also like haptics, uh, and eventually taste and smell. Uh, but by by having a, an immersive virtual reality uh, headset on, you it makes you feel like you have this sense of uh, place presence. It's what Mel Slater calls it. But you have this sense of embodiment that you have uh, this avatar representation like we do have here. But I don't feel like I'm in my body here in this. I'm like looking at this from a third person perspective, looking at myself on stage. Um, and there's certainly ways to sort of have the first person perspective, but uh, to really get that sense of. Um, what Mel Slater calls the virtual body ownership illusion of being able to actually move your body around and to see your limbs represented in real time, you really start to take a different level of body ownership. And sure. I think that's where a lot of the VR is starting to come in, in in terms of playing with that virtual body ownership. And VR chat is probably the the experience that is playing with that level of embodiment the, the most. It gives you the most latitude to be able to create these really immersive worlds, uh, but also these avatar representations that are really really quite exotic in terms of lots of different things that people are doing. Sure. Um, so that's that's kind of like an overview of how I start to think about it through this sense of active presence and mental and social presence and embodied presence and emotional presence. And the thing is, is that all four of these things are happening at the same time, but uh, you're kind of modulating things in different ways. Like this experience is highly centered in like the center of gravity is in that mental and social presence. Uh, but, you know, what, so you there's going to be this fusion of everything together. I think this particular environment, um, you know, it's been over, around for over 10 years now. And of course, you've got lots of grids connected together, unlike Second Life, which is just one grid. But we think back to the early days of Second Life, where, you know, for many years, it it was a chat room with text. There was actually no voice. You know, you I, I think the first time, you know, I was in Second Life, I had to communicate with people via Skype simultaneously. Because uh, unlike most people who say, I don't do voice, I was wandering around with a T-shirt saying, I don't do text. You know, it was almost like a war between doing one or the other. But then you consider events like, um, uh, not just necessarily here, even in Second Life and elsewhere, say a concert, you know. Um, you When you go to a concert in real life, you enjoy the music and actually you probably, you know, to focus on the music to chat to somebody next door to you. But in fact, through Second Life and here you have dance parties and events and things and if you're on voice it'd be lost over the music so people rely on the fact that they've got the text channel as it were to um, to have a complementary channel for communication while they're listening to music and it seems to me and you mentioned these the um, in the 
let's just call it the COVID world, <laughs> whatever. Um, it seems that big winners um, have been, and you you, um, you mentioned them briefly. Um, uh, one of our cameramen here actually is, is in there all the week, and that is um, Mozilla's um, hubs. And in fact, um, Blair from there was on this panel literally last year. Um, and um, you know, it astonishes me that if you go in there deeply, you can actually have a pretty rich environment. It's, so, you know, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, well, it's a quick link to get in, but it does come with that quick and easy entry point. Uh, there's another one called Frame.io, which doesn't seem to be quite so good, and there's the, uh, the new one you mentioned. Um, how, uh, I mean, over, over and beyond the idea of interoperability, which I think is way down the line, and I've noticed you've been having some conversations with other people on Twitter this week about that. Um, beyond that, how important do you think it is that we have what you call that quick and easy solution? You know, people want to go on a Zoom call, they now get Zoom fatigue, but at least they can't complain it wasn't easy to do. You know, um, yeah. same with Skype. Do you think that is going to be an important factor, um, generally speaking? Well, I'd say that uh, there is a couple of things. There's the quality of the experience that we talked about, the different qualities of presence, and then there's a specific context that you're doing something for. Um, so, but let me let me sort of unpack something that you, we had mentioned: high fidelity and Zoom. And I, I want to elaborate on Zoom just for a second here. Um, so. Zoom is great to be able to have a sense of emotional presence with people because you there, you are passively receiving it in a sense you don't have as much agency, but you're able to see people and see people's faces. And I think that's really quite, quite important, um, especially if we're talking about trying to build trust and, and build relationships with people. And um, you do have the highest transmission of you know your emotional affect when it comes when you can actually see someone's face. And I think that that's part of the reason why I think uh, Zoom. Well, the other thing that Zoom did that I think was different than, say, Skype is that they made it easy, easy just to be able to click a link and be able to get straight in. Yeah. Uh, it's harder to do that with, say, like Skype, where you have to like be someone's friend or be invited. You know, but you they have these more ephemerals, like, okay, I'm going to get in there, get directly into where I need to go, and then hop out. And there's all these different ways to be able to control, you know, that meeting. But um, I we're just in a, you know, a, a uh, the Fifth Wall Forum is having a whole Zoom conference here this weekend as well that I was also kind of hopping over and participating in. Um, but they, the breakout rooms, uh, originally it was hard to be able to uh, have agency as an individual to kind of go to different breakout rooms. And so when you go to an actual conference, you're able to decide where you want to go to, um, you know, if you want to go to this session or that session. But there's this whole other layer of like the interstitial hallways where you kind of randomly run into people. And that I tell you, that's probably one of the hardest things to recreate in terms of having these virtual gatherings is that it's the, you, it's the water cooler, isn't it? Where is it? Well, yeah, yeah, it's almost like you have the 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 session. The session sets a context for people to talk about. But then, you know, uh, are you still able to kind of like roam around a virtual space and kind of run into people and be able to, t to talk to them, you know? And whenever you have the ability to teleport into different places, then you're kind of eliminating those interstitial spaces to be able to, to have those collisions. And so there's an application called Verbella that I think actually did a really yes, good job. Yeah, yes, I know them, yeah. Um, you know, they did for Laval Virtual. Uh, it was the first time I tried it this year where – you do actually kind of locomote through the space uh, and you have this opportunity to kind of run into people. Um, and then, you know, just recently this year was Burning Man in alt space. And I'd say, you know, Burning Man's a type of experience where rather than like focusing on like talks or, you know, a schedule, it's like more of like the on conference where it's more about creating these worlds to be able to explore together. Um, and it becomes more about you exploring those worlds, but also kind of just running into people. And so I'd say like, either you have design decision to like schedule a gathering that is trying to focus on the content being the talks or you kind of do the bottom up where the content is the relationships and the connections between the people. And I think the big open question is like, first of all, how do you do both of those really well, but also like, how do you set the larger context that allows people uh, an idea of why you're gathering? Um, so what some of the things that I saw at the virtual conference scenes, so, so like the uh, IEEE VR, um, that was in Mozilla Hubs. They had these birds of the feather sessions where it's like, okay, uh, we have a, a, a global pandemic and we have all these virtuality researchers that need to learn how to navigate 
uh, how do you do user, user uh, testing in the middle of a pandemic? Well, this is like a problem that a lot of people had. And so you had this shared intention, shared problem of, of people that had a shared context of this academic conference. Let's get together. And there's an invitation that was sent out. Let's have a talk about, you know, how do we navigate this? All those people come together and it's like that ad hoc uh, shared problem, shared intention, shared context uh, that they're able to have this like group discussion that is really able to like solve uh, their uh, what their problems are. Uh, and so I found that, you know, like when you have that, those, all those combinations of the ability to people to, to, to gather together, to, to have their agency, to kind of find that place, to find these other people and to, to have these emergent conversations, the bridge of the feather were still like meet at this place in this time. And I'd say the real challenge still, not only just in virtual gatherings, but uh, face-to-face gatherings is how do you connect the people that have those similar problems and similar intentions to be able to find each other, to be able to like uh, collaborate with each other. And I think that's, that's the essence of like virtual gathering um, is like bringing people together with a shared purpose and how do you connect them and allow them to collaborate with each other. Um, and like the, the, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Think, well, yeah, I think one of the big success stories too here, and I suppose it is a virtual world in a way, <clears throat> is Discord. I mean, I, I originally um, downloaded Discord because I wanted something that wasn't Skype, you know, to have my friends to and whatever. And I realized I could have a server, but at the time I didn't really <laughs> see the implications. But now, of course, you know, there, there are loads of, um, it, it's quite a minefield following all the Discord channels, but it, it, it has kind of worked in an odd way which is not so much here because as you can see we've got a chat room at the side of the window while we're talking but um in in many worlds um where there is no chat for example a couple of them being um you know sort of uh, derived from philip's original high fidelity um they they heavily use discord as a parallel channel so they can do the chatting in text and um, that isn't just a matter of texting. Of course, they can paste in links and put little YouTube videos. You can do it all in Discord. The only thing you can't do is move around and um, have that sort of environmental presence is what it used to be called in Second Life. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, you've redefined that. The embodiment you get through a headset, of course, means that, you know, that degree of presence makes this platform and Second Life fairly laughable. And unfortunately, they can't be converted. You know, there's no way you can, it's to do with the physics. You can't come in here in a headset, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Um, moving on to well, hold well on. let me just uh, just yeah, sort of follow uh, up on that that point yeah. about uh, Discord because I think that's an important point because um, there's existing channels whether that's Facebook or Twitter or uh, Discord or Slack um, these are all like back channels uh, or LinkedIn um, but they're they're able to create these elements of a social graph which is like yeah. you being connected to people and what i found is that like vr chat has its own ability of having a social graph within it so you friend people and connect to people and when you go into vr chat you can kind of go to what your friends are doing um, alt space and burning man um, alt space has really turned out to be like the enterprise corporate marketing or corporate um networking type of yeah. so like you have a lot more professional gatherings there. So um, the Fifth World Forum chose Altspace to do kind of their, their after party. Um, and then you start to friend people. And then when you start to go into Altspace, then it sort of becomes your professional network. Um, and there's like, you know, more of an egalitarian approach with avatars there where everybody kind of has the same choices and options. And you have the ability to kind of customize it. Um, but, you know, you, you look at something like Discord, um, I, I really see that as a really powerful way for these communities to start to emerge to say, okay, let's like start a Discord that has some sort of intention and shared purpose, uh, shared values, and it creates that shared context, but you also have the ability to have the audio chats. Um, so if you're in, going into different games, uh, but you also have the ability to friend people in Discord. So you're able to kind of have this persistence of being able to connect to people and have these back channel conversations that you may run into people. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I use Twitter quite a bit to be able to, you know, connect to different people. Um, and I, I'd say like both of these um, Discord and the, all these social media platforms, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter, uh, but also like Slack, um, this, there's this like big open question that I had, which is the, the experience of having a serendipitous collision at one of these gatherings. Like how do you, you know, uh, define that? Um, and when I was at a conference, I would be just kind of like roaming around the hallways, running into people uh, and people knew me from my podcast. And, you know, so 
and they wanted to be able to share something with me and I was roaming around looking for interviews. And so there was like this, um, uh, conspire, uh, <laughs> this shared intention where I was both seeking for people to talk to and people were seeking me to, they wanted to share something with me. And when, so when we collided and, and would be able to come together, then I would be able to like have that interview. And then once the virtual conferences started, that hallway was like eliminated and all of the, cause all of the conference organizers were like our conference is the talks. And so we're going to make it easy for you to just teleport directly to the talks, but have no interstitial areas for you to kind of run into people. So the places where I was really thriving were disappearing. So I've had over the past year to really have to like redefine what I uh, classify as this serendipitous collision. And I found that it's like, you know, these interactions and these collisions on Discord, these collisions within, you know, Twitter, you know, Mal, you reached out to me on Discord to be like, hey, do you want to be in this uh, this conference here this weekend? I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? Absolutely. Um, so it's like when those different types of collisions happen, then I, I give that a lot of weight in terms of, you know, this is what's emerging in the moment. And I think that's the thing is like the being able to find many different ways for people to connect to each other and find like what is emerging in the moment. This is happening right now. Uh here's a link, you know, dive into this other context that may be a little bit more immersive or have other affordances like this, you know, this, this world has specific uh, avatar representations and identities and people are friends with each other. They can have these back channel conversations with each other. I mean, this is like, you know, you start to f have that built into the system, but you can also like, if that's too overwhelming, then have that in the back channel as well. So I think that's what I see is like, there's, even though there's a gap in a lot of these applications where like in alt in alt space you can actually text people and write back and forth but in like vr chat you can't right so it's like you would have to either do a back channel discord chat to somebody or on twitter dm or text them or you know find another way to communicate with people because you can't do it within the application so yeah it's it's trying to figure out like how to keep the user interface elegant and simple but also if that's a high demand like it'd be really helpful for me to in VR chat, for example, like people can be in a private world and maybe you want to join them, but you have no idea what they're doing. They can only, you know, yeah. disclose what degree they're open to you joining them. If it's green, you have no problem. But if it's like uh, orange or blue, there's like different levels of, of, of privacy that people have in terms of, you know, or uh, red, do not disturb. But uh, you still don't know like what world they're in, what context they're in. Uh, and it's hard to do that within the app itself. And so, yeah, I think this this whole back channel dimension, I think, is a key part of how things are continuing to evolve here. I would tend to agree. In fact, um, <clears throat> I, would, I was kind of raised a couple of issues, and I obviously have a feeling for some of what you think from, um, uh, well, Twitter mostly, to be honest, in your case. Um, <clears throat> VR chat, for example, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm croaking. <clears throat> Um, uh, this week, I think it was, they, they, it's, um, I think it was VLChat, yeah, they've, they've now launched a professional version where you pay. Uh, it's, a, um, it's not perfect, it's a, it's a VRChat Plus, and so it's their, um, you know, if you want to support VRChat, then it's a su subscription service, so it's essentially their business model moving towards a subscription-based $9.99 a month or $99 a month, and uh, yeah, I actually just joined last night and when you join you get like a rather than just 16 avatars you get access to 100 avatars um and then there's uh you get like a, a an icon an avatar that you can put next to your nameplate um and you get some badges and you get increased trust levels but more than anything for me it's like this is a way to sort of get beyond the models of surveillance capitalism yes. and you know <laughs> pay pay for the service that they have and, you know pay for these servers you know it, it's been funded by yeah. bc monday why not sort of pay directly for the services that you're getting rather than having a business model where they're trying to like surveil you and get all this private information about well, that, you? That, that raises the very issue I was <laughs> driving towards. I mean, Slack, for example, was originally they, they wanted to design a game and they couldn't do it. So they formed you know, Slack as it was, but it was a kind of open model. And um, the other horrific news this week is that has now been bought by a sales force of all people who have a reputation for literally destroying everything they buy up, um, which is kind of sad but um we're also faced and you mentioned the surveillance stuff and everything else we're also faced with and again it ha I, I don't think it's any accident that it's we're becoming more aware of it very quickly during the covid period is the the unstoppable you know um bulldozer of facebookers <laughs> i mean i have to mention names here i mean you know firstly they have a social platform so all this behind the scenes back channeling you've already got in a facebook if you see what i mean if, if you can stand it with some of us gone then 
you um, you have the um, extensions led into that social network in the form of uh, Horizons, I think is one, and Spaces is, is, is another. I don't know whether you've actually been into those. And, and then, of course, they now have a... Well, they don't have a monopoly, but they look like they're trying hard to get the monopoly on headsets. So you're, you're dealing with the software platform of virtual worlds, you're dealing with the social network, and you're dealing with the hardware, and you've got one monolithic organization, which is more than capable of surveillance, <laughs> running them all. Now, I just this just makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm I'm all for interoperability between things, but monopolization, um, you know, is is a very different thing. Do you feel there is an inherent threat in the you know this activity because it as as you say you know it includes the headset, it includes the social network, and it includes the virtual environments potentially, and. Um, you know, maybe everything will interoperate, but nobody else will be able to get into it, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a lot of thoughts about this. This is like kind of the existential uh, dilemma of our time where we have these big mega tech corporations that are uh, controlling a lot of things. I mean, that's the big reason why there's been these antitrust cases that are, uh, you know, in the United States against folks like Amazon and Apple and Google, as well as Facebook. And so this is like... Uh, you know, decades worth of uh, anti-competitive behaviors that are happening within these companies that they have all sorts of ways of either acquiring, killing, or copying their competition, uh, which creates this, you know, economies of scale where, you know, as soon as you get these big major tech corporations, then they just have the power to basically, to either uh, buy up all the competition, to be able to uh, just uh, uh, kill them off in different ways or to copy them, just clone uh, so the copy, cl clone, and acquire. So that's a whole dynamic that has been happening for a long time that sets the broader context for uh, in order for anybody to create the technology platforms, you have to have access to an enormous amount of capital. So you have a duopoly of uh, cell phones uh, providers between like Apple and, and Android in terms of the operating systems, at least. Um, and then you have, uh, with VR, you have... Facebook that has been really out there, but you know, basically in the standalone VR market, uh, not really any competition. Uh, Google has made so many different failures in their own strategy that they've yeah. basically uh, pretty much shuttered so many different aspects of their VR strategy. They're focusing more on AR at this point. Uh, but you have Apple, who's also been developing a lot of these different things, but they've been secretly developing everything, and they're just, you know, they're going to wait until they're ready to start to launch it. But they've been completely absent to this larger discussion. Uh, so you have what is essentially going to be like this battle between Apple and Facebook to these two closed world gardens who, uh, in each of their own ways, Apple especially, uh, Apple being extremely ex antagonistic to all these open standards, whether it's OpenXR or WebXR, uh, they're just kind of like doing their own thing. And like, if you yeah. want to have any sort of application, you have to have like their native solution for whatever that is, um, you know, snubbing, <laughs> turning their nose up against even GLTF and creating their own kind of proprietary or going with the Pixar uh, US uh, ZD uh, format. So you have this larger context. Um, and I think Lawrence Lessig, uh, in his approach of what he calls a pathetic dot theory, saying that there's these dials that you can turn to be able to, to control different social socioeconomic dimensions of any issue when it comes to the scale. So you have these four major ways to do that. You have the law, the, uh, and that's sort of the dimension of the tech policy and the antitrust and, and, and the regulation to be able to, to rein this stuff in that's been kind of absent uh, for, some, for so long to kind of accelerate uh, the issue that I was talking about earlier about the, these monopolies that are really having too much power and control over our lives. And then you have the market dynamics, which is you know the competition amongst these different players. Uh, and if for whatever reason they've have one player that's decided to make the market risks, and other people have just decided not to take the chance, or like Google really stepping back with a lot of their strategy. Yeah. Um, and then you have the market, which is, or the the culture, which is the, the us uh, people the people who are actually consuming stuff. It's all the ways of uh, people talking about stuff. Uh, uh, either they're boycotting uh, this person or not, or educating people about the options. And so using all the different uh, media and journalism to be able to cover what's happening. So you have this sort of choice as to what they're going to do, or what, whose companies they're going to support or not. And then the last one is the technological architecture and the code. 
Um, so that's where you get into something like this, like the, the radically decentralized options versus like the, the centralized options. So you can you can start to fight back uh, by just creating the open web or, or open alternatives that are not sort of falling into this closed walled garden mindset. Um, the challenge is that, uh, let, let's just like take as an example, high fidelity versus VR chat. So high fidelity, Philip Rosedale, obviously coming from Second Life, he learned that, you know, in order to really scale uh, these different virtual worlds, you, you have to have these huge server farms. Uh, and there was like this fundamental uh, economic issue that like if you wanted to have a metaverse that as big as we all want it to be, then, you know, you're going you're to have to have people run their own servers. But the problem was is that the, uh, the, the, the quality of the experience of something that's an immersive virtual reality experience has not been proven out to the point where people are willing to go through that much trouble. And that there's so many different issues with uh, uh, just standing up a server and dealing with security and all the people that are, all the viruses and the malware and everything else. You know, there's a lot of stuff you have to, you yeah. have to be simply like a, a system administrator to be able to actually stand all that up and, and have the, both the technical expertise, but also the money and the resources and you have to maintain it. So the centralized economies of scale from these major companies have been like they've eliminated all that and they're just really focused on the experience. Uh, but they do all these other sort of you know surveillance capitalism things to really sustain it that have these other you know side effects. And so I think uh, the challenge of like something like uh, this dialectic is that you look at something like VR chat that has just stood up all this stuff and they paid for all the servers and they've taken care of all that problem. Um, and they have proven that they've been able to really grow those networks of people because the, the experience has been so compelling. But yet, uh, what about WebXR? Well, WebXR is sort of stagnant because you know Apple is refusing to to you know if you want to implement a WebXR experience, then you know you may have to deal with it not being able to be available for anybody who has an iPhone, iOS, or you know using Safari. It's like they've just refused to implement those open standards. So then you have like. Google that's starting to implement all that, but yet, you know, their own strategies, you know, been really uh, fragmented and not really coherent anyway, because they've been also taking that sort of decentralized approach generally. And they've, they've also found that they've had difficulties trying to get really, uh, things really kickstarted. So I feel like there's a lot of these different dialectics and decisions that you have to make. And then unfortunately we live in a world where, uh, it's just, we've had so much power and consolidation for those tech companies just because it's so difficult to kind of do it on your own. Um, but I do think that the, it's a pendulum that swings back and forth and that we will be starting to hit to this point where we start to do these more decentralized approaches. Yeah, I think so long as competition still exists, you know, and you aren't dealing with actual monopolies. I mean, there's still the danger of a cartel, of course, but I mean, um, you know, there is some safety in that. So I'm a big fan of Apple, but sometimes I get distressed when I think, you know, well, how can I say I'm a fan of Apple and <laughs> loathe Facebook so much? Um, you know, I, I think it really is a matter of, 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 you know, size when you've got a corporation that's bigger than a greater economy than the GDP of a few countries, you really wonder what's going on. Um, and the other thing, actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, one of the things, I, I have a region or mega region attached to OpenSim here, uh, which is a grid in its own right, but you can jump to it and have friends across grids here because um you know so something called the hypergrid which um was mentioned earlier it was created by krista lopez who was one of the devs here and um um the, although it wasn't mentioned in the summary i mean i use a, a, ch a chap who's got a service called dream world which basically means i I'm, I'm actually running the server for the whole virtual world on one of my computers but um, it, it's rooted um, through um, an IP database, I guess it is, at uh, um, another company called Dreamworld. So it's much harder for to imagine, you know, because the, the obvious threat, as you mentioned, is security, where somebody can just teleport into your world on your own computer. They can do <laughs> all ends of damage, you know. So, um, you know, you need to have the security in place there. But... Um, I remember many years ago, I asked somebody from Microsoft long before, you know, it must have been over a decade ago uh, in Second Life, they were talking there. I said, well, will Windows ever be a virtual environment, you know, like rooms? Uh, somebody actually did it about 10 years ago as a plug-in program and it, um, but, you know, it took over the interface and you were able to create your own objects like you can here 
and you can tag, you could link the objects to anything in your system, be it a PDF, or you can have a bookcase for the PDFs. Uh, you could have a application launcher. It basically became the replacement for the Windows desktop. And um, I, I, I love that because it, it was the first example, really, uh, uh, probably before Second Life, that I saw of, of that 3D environment being a utility. I don't mean just fun. I mean, um, being able to utilize, you know, it, it, the room, the 3D environment or the rooms were your central hub. You did everything from there, whether it was reading, going on the web, um, launching your applications and whatever. And um, I'm, I'm wondering about the future of that. So I know in VR, and the particular stuff you cover, um, you know, some of these front ends, as it were, are quite capable of pulling in um, you know, stuff from elsewhere, uh, certainly on the cloud, but the thought that people might ultimately be able to pull in um, things from their own computers, their own environment into a virtual interface. Have you, have you felt there any indication of that sort of thing coming along as a, a yeah. sort of the leap, as it were? You mean like pulling in what type of other objects into it? Like what, can you give an example, like a photo or a video, or what do you mean exactly? Oh, yeah, well, yes, a photo or a video, but in a, a more extensively than that, um, something that actually works as your starting environment, whether you're, almost whether you're offline or online, everybody's online now, but, you know, the you, you'd log in at the beginning of the day into your virtual room, whether it was in a headset, or whatever is on a 2D screen, but instead of a, a, um, a Windows desktop or a Mac desktop, your literal, your desktop would be, have turned into a 3D environment. So that a 3D metaphor takes over everything you do in the day or night. Yeah, yeah well, I, I know we have about uh, five minutes to, to wrap up here, so maybe this might be my, my sort of final thought here. Uh, <laughs> I which is, were, yeah. <laughs> which is that, um, yeah, I, you know, the, the, this transition into from 2D to 3D is something that is a, a huge paradigm shift. And it's something that people in this community have already been working with for, you know, like you said, over 10 years now and, you know, even longer with Second Life. And so, but, you know, those spatial computing metaphors um, to add different levels of our embodiment, new interaction design. For me, the way I think about it is that you're combining all these different design disciplines from game design to user interaction design and web design and, you know, literature and written text and all those affordances of how you tell stories with words. Uh, but also like uh, cinematic storytelling and industrial design and architecture and dance and embodiment and all these other ways as well. So, uh all these different design disciplines you're fusing together. Uh, and this is going to be a long process. It may be 10 years or so, maybe 20 years. Uh, we've already been on, under that process for, for just doing stuff on the web uh, and, you know, and on the internet as well. So I think that as we're starting to like move into this new paradigm of spatial computing, then you, you have to like figure out all the affordances of all these different things. And you have like these weird collaborations uh, from like architects, you know, working with theater folks uh, or people who are web designers working with people who are uh, Hollywood storytellers um, and interaction designers and game designers uh, working with, uh, you know, other <laughs> dimensions of uh, industrial design. So, you know, you have this fusion of all this stuff, but both happening with virtual reality and augmented reality and just virtual worlds in general. And so uh, this is going to be a long journey. Uh, and, you know, for whatever metaphors we have for you know, pulling in different objects and the operating systems and, you know, uh, and how to sort of pull in the media, you know, there's there's certainly, you know, like Mozilla Hubs it was a great example of being able to kind of dynamically pull in that information. It's probably like, the one application because it's on the web is pulling in most of those affordances of the web the most because you're on your PC or on your computer. It's easy to kind of throw in a link, but these other systems that may be in VR are harder to do that. So, I mean, that's, that's why I, you know, I, I think this is sort of like, you know, for me, at least this, this paradigm shift into spatial computing is, you know, for me, one of the, some of the most hardest uh, problems. And for me, what makes it most so interesting is that it's so interdisciplinary bring it to all these different disciplines because each of these different disciplines have this unique lens into the answers that they have to provide. And so the big challenge is how do you combine all these different expertise? Uh, and that's, that's a lot of what I've been just covering on the voices of VR podcast and, it's, you know, just yeah. trying to talk to these people and try to, you know, have a, a water cooler to be able to, to see how all these things are going to come together. 
Well, I think, yeah, I think we should let people know because uh, um, VoicesOfVR.com is your website. And as I mentioned earlier, that you, you have a remarkable number of podcasts there. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's no one person that seems to cover like you do. The, the, the comp- I mean, sometimes you, you're almost at the fringes of the metaverse virtual world's interest, you know, um, but you cover so much. Um, you know, and uh, I don't know where you get the energy, to be honest, but, you know, there's, there's almost, it seems to me to be almost nothing you haven't touched in those podcasts, um, you know, when it comes to organisations, people and things that are using, um, you know, uh, virtual reality or indeed virtual spaces, even if it's not in the headset, kind of, so to speak. Um, but you're right, the worst of times in some ways, but the most exciting of times in others. And uh, as you say, we this whole thing is really just beginning. So, um, Okay, now you're also on uh, Twitter.com, aren't you? Twitter.com slash Kent Bai, I guess it is. We give it, make sure yeah, we're I'll, plugging uh, everything for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop that in the chat. I'm also going to drop, a, I, I recently did a talk to architectural students uh, talking about the art of gathering, but also looking at my experiential design framework that I talked about briefly here. But if you want it like a like a deep dive with slides and everything, I have a two hour talk that kind of dives into lots of different dimensions there. If folks want to have more information to kind of see everything, because I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening from this community that's going to be pulling in, especially when it comes to accessibility and really integrating yeah. those those aspects of text chat and everything else. I mean, that there's there's a lot to be learned from what's been happening in, in OpenSIM as well as Second Life that is going to be fused. So you certainly have a lot of puzzle pieces here. Here, that's going to be integrated in. So look forward to connecting to okay. more folks here, and uh, I'll, I'll send some links in the chat if people want to get some more information. Absolutely wonderful. Well, it's been absolutely great having you here. I'm so glad we were able to make it, and you, you, just the mine of information. And I'm sure we could go on for hours if we had the time. Um, before I, I go off air, as it were, I'll just remind folks that I will be back with an actual panel. Um, uh, this time tomorrow, the Sunday, and we will um, have representatives from Science Space, from um, uh, Sansar, and um, two of the offshoots from Philip Rosell's um, High Fidelity, Vicadia and Tivoli. So we're going to have some four, four platforms represented as we look at the sort of new platforms. And I chose them because they, they all four are kind of a bit in the spirit of embracing user-generated content and the sort of things we value about OpenSim here. So until then, um, my thanks to you all and a special thanks to uh, uh, Ken yet again. Awesome. Now. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks, everybody.